Hi, this is Sean Paul Murphy, back with the second chapter of my upcoming paranormal thriller, Chapel Street. It's the story of a man, Rick Backos, who straddles the line between sanity and insanity as he battles a demonic curse which has driven members of his family to suicide for generations. This story was inspired by true events and a true haunting my family endured at our home on 21 St. Helens Avenue. I hope you enjoy it. Chapter 1 RestingPlace.com June 2016 I am a cemetery junkie. My obsession was an outgrowth of genealogy. As a bachelor with no children of my own, I turned my eyes backwards towards my ancestors. I traced all of my familial lines back at least a couple centuries. In the process, I talked to hundreds of cousins while compiling my extensive family tree. They tended to be elderly women, happy to share the stories that their own children and grandchildren had grown bored of hearing. As the years passed, I found myself attending their funerals out of gratitude for the stories and photos they shared with me. Perhaps because of all the funerals I attended, I developed a desire to visit the graves of all of my ancestors. I would visit the overgrown cemeteries, thorns and stickers tearing at my khaki pants and tennis shoes. I often felt an acute, practically supernatural sense of connection to my kin as I stood upon their graves looking down at their weathered monuments. I knew they were all once just like me. They lived, they loved, they fought, they laughed, they worked, then they died. But part of them remained, me. Did they imagine when they bought their little oblong plots that 120 years later, a great-great-great-grandson would stand above them in respect? Were they looking down at me from heaven or up from hell? Was there even a heaven or hell? Or did we, as I suspected, just disappear into nothingness? It was maddening to think we lived in vain. How many people in this world truly achieve a legacy that outlives them? None of my ancestors, that's for sure. They were just worker bees, living in little houses and toiling endlessly at jobs to fulfill the dreams of men who the world considered greater and more important than they. What did they have to show for their labors in the end, aside from generations of progeny that they would never know and who would never know them? A tombstone, that was it, a slab of granite or marble with their names etched into it. In theory, those stones could last for centuries, far longer than the once living bones beneath them. That was encouraging, but what did it really say about them? Occasionally, a short poem or Bible verse had been inscribed into the cold stone. That was better than nothing. Most of their markers only recorded their names and the dates of their birth and death. I hated seeing my ancestors, whom I had painstakingly researched over the years, reduced to a mere string of facts. A human being is more than the sum of their name and dates. I wanted the world to get a taste of their individual humanity, their personalities, their struggles, and even their small triumphs, as insignificant as they might have been in the overall scheme of human history. I found a perfect place to honor my family at RestingPlace.com, a vast online database of millions of graves slowly compiled by thousands of volunteers all around the world. I began building online memorials to all of my relatives. I wrote short biographies of them and included plenty of photographs. The website even allowed me to link them all together by familial relationship. A person could easily click through my entire family tree person by person. Now my ancestors were no longer simply names and dates carved in stone. You could look into their eyes and get a sense of their identity. In my own way, I granted my family cyber immortality, which was probably the only actual form available. I couldn't bring myself to accept any sort of spiritual continuance, despite my nominally religious background. My parents were both Catholics, they were not necessarily weekly churchgoers, but they took their faith seriously enough to send my brother Lenny and me to St. Dominic's Elementary School. After my father Stan's death in an automobile accident, my mother took us out of Catholic school 
and unceremoniously dropped us in the Baltimore City public school system. It was probably an economic decision, but I suspect it was also her way of rejecting the cruel God who prematurely stole her loving husband. She attended church much less frequently as the years passed. In the end, she only went for weddings and funerals and the occasional Christmas when she was feeling sentimental. Still, my mother didn't reject all spirituality. She believed in signs and omens and became obsessed with charlatans and fortune tellers who played her like a violin. My religious beliefs also changed with the death of my father. I stopped believing in a loving God who took a personal interest in the lives of his people. It wasn't until college that I pretty much closed the door on the very concept of God itself. I wasn't an atheist. Atheism was too emotionally arrogant for me. I accepted a limit to human knowledge. I could concede that an entity we could define as God could possibly exist somewhere in some unknown dimension. However, for all practical purposes, I believe we human beings were on our own. When we died, we just blinked out of existence. That reality fired my resolve concerning resting place. In the absence of God, I would provide the human race what little measure of immortality I could muster. I began documenting the graves of strangers when I ran out of my own relatives, starting with a small Methodist cemetery a few miles away from my apartment. One sunny Saturday afternoon, I walked through it and photographed every tombstone. I spent the rest of the weekend uploading the photos and documenting the graves on the website. Whenever I came upon a name I found particularly interesting, I would research the individual on various genealogical websites and include the information I found. I found it a very rewarding hobby, much more interesting than my day job as an accountant at Johns Hopkins Hospital. My primary responsibility consisted of checking physical inventories throughout the hospital, counting all of the essential implements of modern medicine. The doctors and nurses got the glory, I got the clipboard. By the time I finished my rounds, it was time to start walking those same corridors again. At least I got some fresh air when I documented the graves, and people really appreciated my genealogical efforts. Every week I got emails from happy people thanking me for finding the graves of their relatives. No doctor ever thanked me for ensuring that rubber gloves were nearby when he needed one. No patient did either for that matter. I also made it a habit to fulfill photo requests that people submitted to the website. I would drive out to the cemetery and get the location of a requested grave from the office. Sometimes the cemetery had no record of the loved one in question. In that case, I would send an email to the submitter saying so. If I found their loved one, I would photograph the grave and upload the picture to the website for them. They were generally very grateful. In a world defined by death and sorrow, it felt great to do something nice for strangers. I hope you enjoyed that chapter of Chapel Street. Feel free to check out my webpage, seanpaulmurphyville.blogspot.com. For all things Sean Paul Murphy, you can also read my series of blogs about the true haunting that inspired this novel there. See you next week.